David Lim of the Port Authority. I would first like to say that was one of the most moving statements I've ever heard and uh, makes what I have to say, I guess, pale in comparison. I would like to thank the Commission, Governor Kane, for allowing me to uh, speak before you today in regards to my personal experience on 9-11. <coughs> As uh, Mr. Weiser said, if what I can tell you will help you in any way, find the cause, prevent the future happening of any <coughs> event such as this, speaking from a police officer's point of view, it will be greatly appreciated. I saw, I saw a great number of my brethren 37 Port Authority police officers were killed that day. The Port Authority police only has 1,100 police officers at that time. And that, therein lies my responsibility, the same as Mr. Weiser's. I have to speak now for those who can no longer speak. I guess that's where it lies heaviest for me. These men and women I, like myself, we're just doing our jobs that day. Something we do every day. And only recently, I guess, it's appreciated, unfortunately, through our great loss. Some would ask why the Port Authority Police was in the World Trade Center. With the exception, probably, of Governor Kane, of course. The Port Authority Police are in the World Trade Center because the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey built the World Trade Center. They built it back in the 70s. And from the first time they dug the first hole, there was a Port Authority police officer present to provide security for that area. When I first became a police officer, it was back in 1980. I'll be perfectly honest, I didn't know a lot about the Port Authority police. I wanted to be a police officer. I wanted to serve the public. So I learned. I learned that the Port Authority police, responsible for the most most of the public transportation facilities in the Dubai State area, which of course includes tunnels, bridges, airports, areas which obviously need security, but post 9-11 have now become the most highlighted areas in this area, in this um, theater of terrorism. But I digress. I wanted to say a lot of things today about the Port Authority, and, but I think I just I said enough about that. And I'm going to tell you about what happened to me that day. When I tell you this, I want you to remember, what I tell you is not the story of just David Lim. It's the story of every police officer, firefighter, EMS, civilians that were helping out that day. As the governor, Governor Pataki said to you earlier, it was a day that we all came together. We, everybody, pulled together to help everybody else. And you'll understand that as I tell my story. I, myself, have been a Port Authority police officer for 23 years. The greater part of that, at the World Trade Center Command, until I got into the uh, K-9 unit and uh, did that, doing that for the last six years. And that's where my story begins. I was working on 9-11, like I do every day, with my partner, Cirrus, the, uh, my explosive detector canine, checking trucks coming into the World Trade Center. This was considered vital, considering what happened in 93. Uh, we did this every day with a great feeling that we were accomplishing a very necessary job. The Trade Center itself, I can speak to the security. They, we had Delta barriers and all kinds of security uh, situations set up to prevent future terrorist attacks after 93. On that day, 
I had just finished up searching a multitude of trucks with my partner and had retired to my office to do my paperwork and have a little breakfast. 8.45 a.m., all that changed. I was in the basement of number two World Trade Center, yet I felt the shock of the first plane hitting Tower One. And that can give you at least a start or the idea of the power of that hit if I was in the basement of the other building. I secured my partner in his kennel, told him that I had to go help the people. He was a bomb dog, not a search and rescue dog, and I figured he would be safe there while I went to assist. Unfortunately, that was the last time I saw him. I went over to tower number one, to the mezzanine level by the plaza, of, uh, by the sound stage where they, were, they would have the summertime shows. I was assisting people out of the A staircase as they were coming out of the building. At this point, the debris was already falling onto the plaza. Somebody screamed that a body was outside on the plaza. I went over to investigate, and sure enough, it was the first body that I had seen. It's not something that I'm going to describe here. There's no point. It was just something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Here, here as a police officer at that point, I guess 21 and a half years, was what I thought was the most important thing. I had a, a, a body, a DOA. I had a lot of procedures to follow. And I went to call in on the radio. And as, just as I did that, another body fell about 10 feet away from that one. And all of a sudden, what I thought was the most important thing to take care of was this body became inconsequential in the fact that obviously things were a lot worse than this one body that I had seen. I took it upon myself at that point to start heading up into the building to, to assist before people would start jumping out of the building. I started going up the stairs. And I saw a lot of frightened faces. People were asking me what was going on. At that point, I had already heard about the airplane, but I had lowered my radio to prevent people from getting too scared. I kept on going up, telling people to keep going down. Down is good. I remember walk, running into people, similar to Mr. Weiser, and that were burned, asking for help. What I did was I assigned those people to people that were healthy to help get them down. I felt the greater good was for me to get to a higher point to try to assist those people upstairs. I got to the 27th floor and I saw a man in a wheelchair waiting with his friend. I remember this because it's very important. I went up to him and he said he was waiting for the crowd to clear and that he would go down. Coming up another staircase, uh, the B staircase, was the fire department who said that they would take care of the gentleman and that if I wanted to proceed up. Well, I, I went into the staircase that they came out of and as you'll hear, it was very important. As I went into that staircase, there were more people coming down. There were some clogs, but people in generally, they were calm and they were not too frightened at this point. It was still rather early, but they were going down orderly. I got up to the 44th floor of Tower One, the Sky Lobby. I had made that my goal based on the fact that there are, are express elevators that are situated on that floor. And my fear was that people coming from the middle floors would get onto those elevators and try to take a quicker way down. I've learned from my training in ESU that an elevator is probably not one of the better places to be, and I apologize for that. You know, it's just you didn't know, obviously, you know, at the time. You know, that's, I'm talking about post-emergency. Uh, and sure enough, as I was, just as I was starting to get the people down, out of, out of, I felt another collision, and out, out of the left, on the left side, looking out the window, I saw this rain of fire coming down, and it blew out the windows on the 44th floor. Fortunately, I was right in the middle. I was not burned, but I was knocked to the ground uh, by the uh, concussion. I grabbed whatever people I had left, and at this point, as you say, I knew we were under attack. I thought it was an accident. There's no reason to think otherwise at that point. A horrible accident, something we actually had trained for, I remember, in the 80s, 
in case something like that would happen. But as I started going down and taking the people with me, I could see the fear in their eyes growing. The building now was starting to shake. It was not as stable as, you know, it was, in other words, it was not uh, very stable. I'll just leave it at that. As we were going down, I was clearing the floors, getting people that were left behind that were waiting. Most of them were either handicapped, elderly, had some of those kind of disabilities. But at this point, there was no more waiting. We had to go. So I proceeded to, to gather them, right, and start going and start heading down. Got to the, about the 35th floor in that general area. I don't remember specifically when I felt the building shaking. I thought for sure that my building was collapsing. It shook and it stopped. Then I heard on the radio something I'll never forget. It was uh, from our police desk over at Five World Trade Center. And the transmission said, Tower 2 is down. All units evacuate Tower 1. I couldn't believe it. What do you mean Tower 2 is down? I mean, it's the World Trade Center. Each building, 1,477 feet, can withstand anything. But it also raised in my mind, if that building can fall, so can mine. And now the people I was with were very upset, of course. But with, I just told them we had to keep going. And we started heading down again. On the 21st floor, I ran into three of my supervisors, Chief Romito, Captain Mazza, and Lieutenant Siri. They were assisting a gentleman who was having difficulty walking and breathing. They were making a stretcher out of a, um, a soda push cart. I told the chief about the other building going down and that this, this collapse was imminent. So we got, he, he gathered the, the gentleman, one arm over his shoulder. Lieutenant Siri grabbed the other arm and he proceeded to take him down the building with Captain Mazza behind him, myself, and our people. We went down as we were going down, and now we were starting to lose power in the building. The lights were going on and off. We had some emergency lighting in the staircase, and after 93, they had painted stripes in the glow, and it was very eerie watching the, watching the stairs as they lit up. But I concentrated on the task at hand, which was to get the people out of the building. I got down to the fifth floor, and I saw and that's where I met Josephine Harris and Ladder Company 6. Ladder Company 6, a uh, fire company out of Chinatown. Josephine Harris, a Port Authority employee, had walked down 72 flights, and she had a bad leg problem, and she had, could go no further. Captain Jonas of Ladder 6 was attempting to find a chair to put her in to uh, help carry her down. I told the captain it was too late, and following my chief's lead, I grabbed Josephine by one arm. Uh, firefighter Tommy Falco grabbed the other arm with Billy Butler right behind us, and we started going down. I remember my captain, Captain Mazza, telling me to leave and let the fire department handle that and to go with her. And I just said, I, I'm helping out, just go ahead. Well, one more flight down was as far as we got and the building started coming down. I knew it was, that was it because the other building was already gone. The memory of that is very sharp in my mind. It's something I'll never forget. People always ask me, of course, but it's, I knew it was coming down and all I could think of was, well, if I can protect Josephine from the debris. So me and Tommy were covering her and it started coming and you could feel the wind of, the, of pushing down as they were compressing through the building. You could hear the sound, it was like an onrushing locomotive or an, or an avalanche, right? You could almost hear the sound of the floors pancaking on top of each other as they were collapsing. As we all know, they collapsed straight down. Actually, one of the firefighters, uh, Maddie, actually blew right by us as he went down. I didn't even know that until afterwards. And it just kept coming and coming. And I guess my final thoughts were about my family. I thought about my wife, my kids. <sighs> Excuse me. 
I hope they would think, think well of me for what I did. I was very fortunate. When the debris stopped falling, excuse me. Just take your, take your time. First I thought I had died. Thank you. I heard nothing, I saw nothing. But then I heard a voice. I heard a voice that was the voice of Captain Jonas, my new friend. It was the voice was, who's here? And I heard firemen that were still in the stairwell with us, shouting out their names, companies. I remember saying, um, Lim, Port Authority Police. Which we couldn't see each other. There was with the, it was totally black. We couldn't breathe. We had to try to breathe through our shirts. But we were failing in fairly good shape. We were alive. And we, we were very grateful for that. I hooked up with Captain Jonas and the men of Ladder 6. And there were other five companies below us, of course. There was a total of... 12 firefighters, Josephine and myself in that stairwell. And for five hours, we fought to get out of there. Mm. When I say we fought, we fought as a team. There were times, you may have heard in New York, of how firefighters and police officers sometimes don't get along. Well, we changed all that. Between their, their actions and my expertise, after working almost 20 years in the building, right, we did manage eventually to work our way out. We also managed to get a hold of our families. I was fortunate enough to have a couple of cell phones and we managed to get through to let them know that we were okay. And that was probably one of the hardest moments for me, I was trying to explain to my wife mm. that I might not get out of there. But she's strong, good cop's wife. She understood. I was doing my job. We ended up going up to get out through the sixth floor, top of the staircase. We had started smelling jet fuel in the staircase, unburned jet fuel. And the fear of fire had um, caused us to work even harder to get out. We saw a light um, on the, over the sixth floor staircase. And our first thought that the floor was, had power on it and that was virtually or at least partially intact, we could make our stand there. We felt we would be there for a lot longer than five hours. As it turns out, as that light got brighter, it turned out to be the sun. We were virtually standing on top of what was left of the World Trade Center. When I say that, you have to picture a straw and a pancake. We were in that straw. By, by, all, the, by all, that, the, all the engineers and everybody else that tried to figure this out, there's no reason why I should be sitting here talking to you right now. It was just a small sliver of staircase from the sixth floor down to the first floor. Damaged, though still enough to keep us alive. That preserved our, our lives. We finally got through on the radio to... Uh, Ladder Company 43. And uh, they managed to come and throw us ropes. We managed to climb down onto the debris field in order to exit. They sent two of their officers to stand by with Josephine for a, uh, a basket in order to carry her out. But then, became, then came the trek to get out of ground zero. And that in itself was treacherous. One of our party had a concussion Mikey Meldrum, so I was helping him. The field was still on fire. There were things that we saw that, like I said, there's no need to repeat. So we attempted to exit actually through, ironically enough, the U.S. Customs House over at Six World Trade Center. 
but then we saw fire, and we heard what we thought was gunfire. And I guess in my moment of stress, I thought we were under attack, and these guys had landed on the beach. And all I could think of was, well, I got 46 rounds. I'll take them. But as it turns out, it was just ammunition going off. But we still couldn't go out that way. We ended up going out by One World Trade Center, exiting on West Street. Finally got out, I believe it was around 3.30 or so. And we were beaten, but we were alive. We virtually, with uh, minor injuries, myself, was taken to the hospital with a concussion and some leg and back injuries, which I've recovered from. But I guess it's the uh, mental injuries that I, I still suffer at times. I guess I still have some nightmares. I still have trouble, as you can see, talking about this at times. But I think it's important that we, as a people, move on. One of the questions that I'm usually asked when I do speak about this is, why don't I retire? I'm a 20 plus uh, man, I can retire anytime. And my answer is that I'll retire at a time of my choosing, not at the choosing of some knucklehead from Afghanistan. No way is he gonna determine when this cop is gonna quit. I just, uh, again, wanna thank you for allowing me to speak here. But I don't, I know, um, it's obviously not quite as important as all the people that we lost. I grieve for all those that I knew that day. I grieve for those that I will never know. But I will also grieve for the best partner I ever had. Thank you very much.